launch event. I'm very excited that we got this moving and um, that we start today and that you are all here. So I think it's a fantastic outcome that we are over 100 people. That is very exciting. I'm Sandra Gesing. I'm the vice chair of the US RSE steering committee and I'm from the University of Notre Dame. And I host you to the session today. So the program today, you will hear about what is source. You might have an idea already since you are here and who is behind source and what is coming up in source. And we have a code of conduct. So we want to create a welcoming environment and everyone, um, yeah, we show exclusivity and that that everyone is welcome to talk and show their opinions. So there is a code of conduct you can read on the website. So it's copied or uh, adapted from several events. So when you read it, you will see that, that you probably know it very well. And you have a contact there or four contacts. If something happens, Please really reach out, don't be shy. And um, if something happens in the Q&A or in the chat, um, that is harassment, we keep also the freedom for us to, to remove people from the chat who are not acting in, in a nice manner with other people. So today we, have, we are very excited to have two thought provoking keynotes from Carrie Jordan. I want to dance with somebody and Marianne Hardy, switching off the label Woman in Tech. And after the keynotes, you have um, enough time to ask questions. And um, then we have a kickoff discussion and networking. It will be another Zoom session. So and we will show this session also, um, or the Zoom session also, so that you know where to go. So that would be nice if you stay also for the networking. And now I give it to Claire, the RSE Community Manager. Thank you. Hi, yeah, my name is Claire Wyatt. I'm the RSE Community Manager at the Software Sustainability Institute based at the University of Southampton in the UK. I'm gonna talk about how Source came to be and how you can get involved. Um, first of all, the meaning of Source. So Source stands for Series of Online Research Software Events. And um, why, why we've called it a series rather than a conference will be explained in a second. Source is pronounced like S-O-U-R-C-E, source. And we chose this acronym pronunciation because we hope that this series will be the source of RSE goodness for the community. I know it's cheesy, just run with it. For the rest of 2020 and into 2021 until we can meet in person again. So how did this come about? Well, as I'm sure you're aware, many conference, conferences uh, were cancelled um, in the beginning of the year, both the UK conference and the German conference, and many others have been postponed until later this year to see if they can go ahead. So around in April, I wrote a proposal to see how we can get the whole community and keep them in touch, still share best practice, software skills and socialise as we would do at the RSE conferences, but do that online. I proposed a series rather than whole days because it became clear that being on video calls for a long time was exhausting. People had more work, not less, and were then teaching their children too, along with many other personal commitments. So we decided to create a series of weekly events um, between one to two hours with an option of socialising afterwards. So people can dip in and out of events without putting aside whole days from their week. So in April and May, lots of people got involved, read the proposal and volunteered their time. We, com we formed three committees, an advisory committee, a steering committee and a programme team, maybe too many, all from volunteers giving their time on top of their day job and home commitments. So a big, big thank you from me to all of those people that got involved. Our aims for this series are to create a permanent resource for skills. So we're trying to record everything so it will be more permanent and on a website. Give everyone the opportunity to contribute to an open online series, develop and share knowledge within the wider community, encourage involvement with joint projects, understand our community more and promote diversity and inclusion, develop new research relationships that may lead to future collaborations, 
strengthen international links between all the different national chapters, and provide a show and tell opportunity, maintain momentum of the RSC move movement while we can't travel and have our usual in-person conferences. So we opened for contributions in July, and um, you may have seen that on social media, so we could hit the ground running after today with some weekly events in place, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, the programme and how you can get involved. You get involved in several ways. You can attend our event, join the mailing list um, to be reminded of upcoming events, submit a contribution, and you can also be a mentor if you're interested in that. We're looking for all kinds of contributions, which you can see on the left-hand side of the slide workshops, software demos, panels, poster sessions um, with lightning talks, discussion sessions. We also have um, a wish list on the website where you can suggest an event or a topic that you'd like to see. And if you have an idea and want to find collaborators, you can post it on the Topic Bazaar, which is also on the website. The call for contributions is open continuously with a rolling deadline at the end of each month. So the next deadline is the 30th September. The contributions are then reviewed the week after that deadline by the programme team and contributors are contacted within a few days. So please get involved, please submit a contribution, there's still plenty of time because we hope to carry this on well into 2021. Um, we don't think there'll be any in-person conferences until about now, this time next year, so there's still plenty of time to get involved. Um, and if you'd like to talk to us about our idea, we have a Slack channel on the UKRSC Slack space, source, ask us anything, and a monthly ask us anything session, and the next one is the 23rd of September. Um, information is usually on the website and the Slack of how to get involved in that session. And that's it from me. Thank you, Claire. Oh, and I get, oh, sorry. <laughs> and now I give it directly to Stefan Janusz. Hey, welcome. Also from the German Research Software Engineering Association, I'm Stefan Janosch, I'm a Max Planck Society member and I'm also on the board of the German Research Software Engineering Association. I really would like out to stress out the point that uh, this is really an international effort. You can see all the nice uh, faces of people contributing and helping uh, to this source series and I marked some um, international chapters which have already um, established themselves and if you <coughs> um, are interested in these national chapters then you can follow uh, these very easy to remember links, uh, some follow a certain scheme and yeah have a good time and feel free to spread the word. Thanks, Stefan. I could say it also the German way, of course. Oh, sorry. So now I give it to Mateusz. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Mateusz Kuzak. I'm a committee manager at the Netherlands eScience Center, and I'm also on the core team of the NLRC, so the Dutch RSC community. Um, I will give you a sneak peek of what's coming up. So we have a very diverse and exciting content uh, already lined up. Um, we have uh, open discussion on research software directories, a demo of executive research article by eLife Innovation. Uh, we have few talks uh, about knowledge graphic uh, or knowledge graphs uh, of research software metadata uh, framework for using virtual reality in behavioral science. Uh, what happens when you become or how do you become a self-employed RSE? Uh, how you can improve the fairness uh, with containers? Uh, we have workshops uh, on fair for research software and what do we know or maybe what we don't know about RSC. Uh, so there is something for everyone. Um, and you can find more on the website. So, so on the top of the screen, if you can go back, yes. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so the program uh, URL, uh, the program is updated continuously. Uh, so every time we have, uh, we schedule something new. So first we review, uh, if we accept something, then we schedule it with people who submit, it will show up in the program. So it's worth uh, watching out uh, for new things coming up. Um, and I also would like to encourage you to submit new things. So we're looking at like very diverse types of uh, submissions and uh, you can submit every month. Uh, you can, so you can choose when you want, when you have more time to actually work on that. Uh, you can uh, get help from others to submit something through the Topic Bazaar. 
Uh, but also we can submit something now and say you would like to uh, uh, deliver that in December, for example. So that gives you a lot of flexibility. So we hope that we'll accommodate uh, everyone with, uh, with this. And we're look really looking forward to all the great submissions coming up. And I will pass it over back to Sandra. Thanks, Mateusz. And sorry for the between slide already. That was not on purpose. I clicked on them. To keep so, me well, uh, up. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's really my pleasure to introduce Carrie Jordan, who will talk about I Wanna Dance with Somebody. Um, she's from the Carpentries. Uh, she's the executive uh, director, and she's um, very concerned with inclusive inclusive God, inclusivity <laughs> and equity. And I give it here to Carrie. Can you all see my slides? Great. Thank you yes. so much. Awesome. Thank you so much. So welcome. Welcome to a series of online research software events. And hello, everyone. I bring you greetings from sunny Florida in the United States. Um, I'm Dr. Carrie Jordan, Executive Director for The Carpentries. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here to address you today. The title of my talk is I Want to Dance with Somebody, How Personal Values Drive Inclusion in Data and Research. I'd like to start by saying thank you so much to the source organizers and in particular, Claire Wyatt for inviting me to speak with you today and the Software Sustainability Institute of, and the um, Netherlands East Science Center. So many, so many partners and longtime supporters in the Carpentries. Um, and so I can't wait to see you all in person at some point. <laughs> Thanks so much for inviting me. It's my pleasure to share my thoughts and experiences with you in hopes that you will leave empowered to advocate for inclusion in this community. I want to begin with the end in mind and deliver sort of a call to action to each and every one of you. Write this question down and consider it as you engage in the keynote. How do your personal values align with your, your work as a research software engineer. So I'll say that again. How do your personal values align with your work as a research software engineer? To say that 2020 has been challenging is an understatement. The unprecedented challenges caused by the coronavirus pandemic and the ripple effect of racial injustices have made their way around the globe. Despite these challenges though, I find hope in each and every one of you. And for that reason, I'm really going to open up and be transparent with you about my feelings, including my thoughts on the open data space and feeling like an imposter, the role that research and data plays in my personal life, and what I've learned about building personal values and confidence to work with data through my work at the Carpentries. We'll talk about meaningful equity and finally circle back to that call to action. And I hope you wrote it down. At some point I may burst into song. So just be prepared for that and don't be, don't be afraid if it happens. And hopefully throughout the talk, we can have some fun as well. So here we go. My earliest childhood memory is the first day of kindergarten. I attended Fleming Elementary School on the east side of Detroit, Michigan in the United States. The short walk to the school was about three blocks or so from my house. And the building was one story, but there was an annex attached to separate the little kids from the big kids. And I could not wait to be a big kid and take my classes in the annex. There was something really mysterious about this annex that I couldn't quite put my finger on, but I needed to make it through kindergarten first because I was not a big kid just yet. On the first day of kindergarten, I was so excited. I had a new book bag, new school supplies, new socks with lots of ruffles. I was going to take full advantage of all my teacher and this school had to offer. 
But there was one small problem. I was late on my first day of school. Now, I can't remember why I was late, but I was late, late. I walked into the room and I noticed everyone had already been seated and they were working on the day's lesson. And the way the chairs were positioned, I couldn't just slide into my seat unnoticed. I walked in the room and my teacher stopped what she was doing and she turned to me and shouted, who is that girl coming in my classroom late? My teacher's words give me nightmares to this day. Her words stuck with me so much that I have a tendency to show up early to meetings, dinner parties, church, Zoom calls. I'm always early. <laughs> I made a decision that day at four years old that I would never be late to anything else ever again. So there are several persons credited for this mantra, but it goes a little something like this. Early is on time on time is late and late is unacceptable that experience on my first day of kindergarten helped me identify one of the values that drives me in my role as executive director of the carpentries and that value is be punctual be punctual there's value in it so as i continue to reflect on my childhood and my formative years I thought about my life and where data played a significant role. As I mentioned, I was born in Detroit, what some would consider a big city. And I was born in the 1980s. I know I, I, know I look so young, but I was born in the 1980s <laughs> during a time when my city was at or near the top of unemployment, poverty per capita, infant mortality, my parents were wed and they brought me into this unpredictable world. During this period, my city had gone through horrific disappointment with one of the federal court decisions that would have actively desegregated Detroit and suburban communities. In the 80s, my city became notorious for crime. It was repeatedly dubbed the arson capital of America, the murder capital of America, and the most dangerous city in America. But it wasn't all doom and gloom for my city in the 80s. The Detroit Tigers baseball team won the World Series during that time, and both Nelson Mandela and Pope John Paul II visited Detroit. But to be honest, I don't remember any of that. I don't remember any of the plight and the problems. I remember growing up in this house. I remember backyard barbecues. I remember slumber parties with my cousins. I remember all of my uncles living in our basement at one time or another. I remember making snow angels outside in the winter and jumping through the fire hydrant as water gushed from it in the summertime. I also remember learning that opening a fire hydrant is illegal, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> I remember Christmas lights and Thanksgiving turkeys and the first time my mom added baby carrots to our spaghetti. That was really weird for me. Um, I remember loving my house. I remember loving my family. I remember loving my city. Now, you may have noticed that I repeatedly referred to Detroit as my city. It was then, and though I don't currently live there, it is now because though the plight of Detroit was gruesome, living there instilled values like persistence and resilience. I remember some other things about growing up in Detroit. I remember dropping to the floor as gunshots rang in the new year. I remember having our home broken into during Christmas time and having all of our gifts stolen. I remember my brother being arrested because he fit the description of an armed robber. I remember how difficult it was to plan for celebrations with my parents because they'd been divorced since I was three. 
all of these anecdotes are data points. And if we were to trust this data, a Detroiter like me, who was born in the 80s, would presently live below the poverty line and work in either accommodation or food services. If we were to trust these data points, a Detroiter like me, born in the 80s, would presently rely on federally funded programs to support themselves. But there was another plan for me. And that plan began with these two, Myling and Albert. <laughs> My parents taught me to work diligently, to get good grades. I played sports, I sang in the choir, I did everything that I thought I needed to do in order to get into engineering school. About 10 hours north of Detroit, there's a small town in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan named Houghton. And that's where I went to school for my undergraduate degree and my master's degree. Michigan Technological University is a place that I never thought I would end up. I was one of the only women and one of the only people of color in most of my classes, but I was determined to do well because I got accepted into engineering school. I was invited to the party, so to speak. After earning a bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering, I decided to pursue my PhD. But I wanted to address the fact that there weren't enough people who looked like me in the field. So I switched my focus from mechanical engineering to engineering education. And that's how I learned about many of the techniques that the carpentry teaches. I learned about building community, et cetera. I earned a master's in education and a PhD in engineering education from The Ohio State University. But despite all of that, all of these accomplishments, I still felt like an imposter. I remember the first time a colleague introduced me to someone looking to learn about assessment for data science curriculum. And in their introduction, they introduced me and they used the word expert. Now I was totally thrown off by that because at the time, I'd only been working in this space for six months and I could barely import a CSV into R. How am I an expert? My research practices were horrible. I had no idea what a workflow was. I never heard the term reproducibility and I had been storing my data in multiple formats all over the place. If you don't believe me, I'll prove it to you. Here is a screenshot of an email that I received from a graduate student who wanted to replicate the protocol for my dissertation. So my dissertation research was an intervention to increase engineering self-efficacy for first year engineering students of color. In this email, the graduate student wanted to understand how many students were in the treatment group, how many students were in the control group, and they had been emailing me back and forth, back and forth, trying to recover my notes and all of my weird spreadsheets and all of that. <laughs> this was more than two years after I defended and had completed a postdoc and I was working in assessment for the Carpentries, an organization that stresses the importance of reproducibility in research. Needless to say, working in this space and being introduced as an expert while at the same time being ashamed that I could not help a graduate student reproduce my study made me feel like a total imposter, a total imposter. In my own words, imposter syndrome is the belief that your success is illegitimate and that at some point you will be found out. I was working for an organization that develops and teaches lessons on the fundamental data skills needed to conduct research, but my own research practices were horrible. And at any moment, somebody was going to find out. <laughs> the day I realized 
I wasn't an imposter was the day that I received this note from a colleague. It reads, thank you for letting me help with assessment and driving our community forward with data. You see, what makes an expert is not that the individual knows everything. Having comprehensive or even authoritative knowledge is nothing if you aren't creating an environment where others feel comfortable contributing to your work. So for this individual, I had done that. I no longer feel like an imposter. Plus, I learned how to keep my raw data raw and I know how to use version control. So everything's fine now. <laughs> so two of my personal values thus far, be punctual and value others' contributions. At the Carpentries, we engage daily in the struggle to democratize data and computational skills to redistribute power to individuals who have been marginalized or who, like me, feel like imposters. And most of all, to engage in and solve problems through collaboration, equity, and access. The individuals who make up our community are truly the most important part of our organization and our strongest resource. Through our programs, we are working to dismantle the broken power structures and resource distribution that negatively impact marginalized communities around the world. We are empowering diverse groups of people to work with data and code, but these ideals did not fall out of the sky. The Carpentries has built its foundation to build global capacity with values that have and will continue to shape the way we grow inclusive computational communities. I'm passionate about this organization because these values align with my personal values. The Carpentry's vision is to be the leading inclusive community teaching data and coding skills. Our first lesson program, Software Carpentry, was founded on these values. Feedback, gratitude and collaboration. If you don't believe me, I will prove it to you once again. Maya Angelou said it best when she stated, I have great respect for the past. If you don't know where you've come from, you don't know where you're going. So after considering my own history and my journey to data, I took a stroll down memory lane and read some of the earliest blog posts on Software, Software Carpentry's blog. And I noticed from these posts that feedback, gratitude, and collaboration were right there from the start. Nearly every blog post ended with one of these calls to action. Timely feedback would be greatly appreciated. Comments and feedback would be greatly appreciated. As always, comments are greatly appreciated. Comments and criticisms are very welcome. As always, comments and corrections are welcome. Comments and criticisms are invited and appreciated. Suggestions would be particularly welcome. Feedback, gratitude, and collaboration. These three values are the foundation the carpentry stands on today. These values are what helps us develop programming and resources, all the while prioritizing equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Now let's do some jargon busting. What do I mean by equity, inclusion, and accessibility? These terms that we kind of throw around all the time, right? To me, equity is about creating opportunities for equal access to and participation in programs that are capable of closing participation gaps in your community, whatever that means for you. For example, Angus McGuire adapted this image to illustrate the difference between equality and equity. Equality is about sameness. It promotes justice by giving everyone the same thing, but it can only work if everyone starts 
from the same place. So in this example, equality only works if everyone is the same height, but we know that's not the case, right? Equity is about fairness. It's about making sure that people have access to the same opportunities. Sometimes our differences, our history, those types of things create barriers to participation. So we must first achieve equity before we can enjoy equality. Now let's talk about inclusion. Inclusion is the active, intentional, and ongoing engagement of diverse communities and people. Advocating for inclusion increases awareness, content knowledge, and empathetic understanding of the ways we interact and change our community. We put so much attention on diversity, especially in research and data, but diversity does not equal inclusion. It's not the same thing. Diversity refers to individual differences and group social differences that can be engaged in the service of learning. Our individual differences, they can be personal, language, learning preference, life experience. Our group social differences can be race, ethnicity, class, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, sexual identity, country of origin, ability status, cultural, political, social views, all kinds of affiliation, that is diversity. Rather than labeling one another and seeing our differences as a threat, I encourage us to use our differences to engage in the service of learning. We can see each other as human, but again, diversity does not equal inclusion. Let me explain by sharing one of my favorite quotes by Verna Myers. Diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Now, how would you feel? You put your best foot forward, looking nice. You work so hard that you will get invited to the party. And when you get there, you're standing in the corner the whole night because nobody asked you to dance. You know the song, right? I wanna dance with somebody. I wanna feel the heat with somebody. With somebody who loves me. Inclusion. It's more than inviting people who don't look like you to the conversation or to the workshop or to, to the training, to the conference. Inclusion is about ensuring that they're able to interact and contribute in ways that are meaningful to them. Diversity is situated around a deficit model. There aren't enough women, there aren't enough this people, there aren't enough that people. But inclusion promotes an equity paradigm. All right. When we talk about accessibility, I'm referring to program and process design and implementation that offers multiple avenues for access and participation. In other words, accessibility is the usability of a product, a service, an environment, or a facility by people with the widest range of capabilities. So we know that there are four major categories in terms of accessibility visual, hearing, motor, and cognitive, right? For example, I'm sure you're familiar with accessibility accommodations like closed captioning or displaying the audio portion of a program as text on a screen. But there are other ways to think about inclusion, like identifying unusual words or jargon busting. There are certain conditions that make it difficult to understand non-literal word usage or figurative language. One of the most interesting examples I can share, it's very embarrassing, is <laughs> a group of Carpentries instructors were putting together a series of community calls with various themes ranging from teaching your first workshop to navigating unpredictable learning environments. So I had the bright idea of calling this, this community discussion 
balling and balling on a budget and it was going to be a community discussion about running workshops with little to no money now the name of this discussion would have gone over fantastically in the black community in the united states because balling means to have wealth or <laughs> affluence however in other areas across the globe balling is an extremely offensive term I didn't know that. Accessibility. So in our work, what can we do to make our code, our content knowledge, our documentation accessible and the language understandable to all? Now, let me take a pause here for a moment so we can do a quick pulse check. In the beginning, I asked this question. How do your personal values align with your work as a research software engineer? I shared my personal values through stories, weird singing outbursts, <laughs> and I shared my, my journey to data. I share anecdotally about the Carpentry's values and what informs our decision-making. I want to take that a step further and introduce you to the nine core values of the Carpentries. And I want to give a huge shout out to Sarah Rono, our Director of Community Development and Engagement, who led this work. During our value shaping project, we discovered three themes. Our values reflect what we do, our demeanor, and what we uphold. So consider that for yourself as you're thinking about your personal values. As I go through each of our values for the Carpentries, I want you to consider whether these values align with your personal values and jot down anything that you notice. At the Carpentries, we act openly, we empower one another, and we value all contributions. At the Carpentries, we are always learning we are inclusive of all. At the Carpentries, we champion people first, access for all, community collaboration, and strength through diversity. Before I let you go, I'd like to leave you with something to consider. Science scholarship, and society is better served by having diverse people with the skills to use data to address the questions that are important to them. In your role, your values inform how you do your work. I want to encourage us all to work together to provide easily accessible resources for people who are unfamiliar with the tools and technology that you work with on a daily basis. What if there were a greater diversity in the spoken languages that we interact in? How can we recognize and appreciate the different cultural norms that exist around data, programming, teaching, and volunteering in different regions? How can we recognize and value the various types of contributions that we see? How can we work with existing organizations to reach broader communities rather than building or reinventing our own networks? How can we authentically work with broader communities rather than approach our work with the we're doing it for them mentality? We won't be able to answer these questions or solve these issues immediately but I do want you to realize that your story, your values, and your contributions matter. And if we're going to drive inclusion in data and research, we can only go further if we go together. Thank you so much for inviting me today. There's a URL here and I think they'll link the slides as well for, it includes uh, some resources on values, on codes of conduct, and all types of goodies. Thank you so much. Carrie, thank you so much. This was an excellent thought-provoking keynote. 
and I loved the singing. So what was your first live event? You should, you know, add it um, in our social hour, maybe. Music event, your first live music event. Yes. <laughs> it's probably you gave a show. So I'm also a Zumba instructor. I forgot to mention that. <laughs> Here we go. So thank you very much. We all do this. I know it's not the same when it's virtual, but we give our best. <laughs> so we have questions in the Q&A. So um, I'm not sure I have to ask it now. Can Simon ask it himself? Can we open the tone for him or should I read the question? We can do either way if Simon would like to answer it. Okay, so Simon, you want to ask your question? Uh, need to find him to unmute him. <laughs> Happy to. If it takes too long, I, I, I can read it. I think no. I think that's worked. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> great! I didn't expect to be speaking here. I thought I was just typing away. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you for, for an excellent talk and 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 singing, which is the first time I've ever seen that in a, in any presentation, and I think it should be done in every presentation from now on in. Um, so so my question is is up there. So basically, you know, I completely agree that people, you have to put people first, especially in academia, where they are the main resource for, for, for generating you know, the knowledge that we are all here to do. Um, but I often find that university bureaucracy will work against me in that. Universities are particularly good at putting into place uh, policies that you know, work against people. So do you come across this problem where you have this pull from you know, your philosophy and your desires to treat people uh, as important and then a pull against that due to you know, university bureaucracy and policies, and how do you manage that? I'm assuming that many of your employees will be uh, partially uh, employed by a university as well. Absolutely, so for, for the Carpentries, we are a nonprofit project, so we are able to, to focus more on mission-driven work. So that's a great thing, but, but I think that's also why I chose to pursue nonprofit because I was in and and this is not the case for every university. I know that there are universities out there who do put <laughs> people first. But I had to make a hard decision. When I finished my postdoc, I had the option to go on to pursue academia, you know, as an assistant professor. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do a postdoc first was to understand the culture and to determine whether my values and what I thought was impactful would also be valuable to the, you know, to a university environment. And what I discovered is that that was not the case. And I needed to be in an environment where I could still teach, even with the carpentries, I still teach, I still write, I do research, but I'm able to immediately see the impact that I have on directly on people. And so it was a very difficult decision. Now I'm not encouraging anyone to stop their faculty job and go start a nonprofit or anything like that, but it is something to consider. Is this environment, does this environment that I'm working in align with my personal values? And if not, maybe there's an organization that you can be a part of where you can volunteer your time, where you can feel enriched and so that you can stay, you know, stay motivated to, to work because you're ultimately, you are making a difference. Even, even if the, the university or the structure doesn't promote, you know, people first, you as an individual can still promote people first as you interact with students, as you interact with graduate students and postdocs, you can still, you know, instill that value in people. And if you aren't being fulfilled enough in that role, joining an organization or a volunteer community will definitely help. But ultimately you may, you know, having to think about and really consider for the long, you know, for the long term, does this make sense for where I want to go in my career and what I think is impactful and meaningful. And you may have to make that hard decision to take a step back. Um, Yes, that's what, that's what I think. Again, I'm not encouraging anyone to quit their faculty job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Maybe we can do both. <laughs> <laughs> 
So we have another question from an anonymous attendee. I hope that was not the reaction on, oh no, she asked me to talk myself. <laughs> you know? So um, thank you, Carrie. It was a fantastic talk. How to promote inclusion when you don't have the power in community society institute? I would, I would answer that question with a question, which I know you're not gonna like. And that question is, how do you define power? You know, I think we've been ingrained to think that the person who has the power is always the loudest one or in front of the room or driving a project. But I, I believe that power and leadership is really about service. So if you are in a position to serve others, you actually are more powerful because you have the ability to make impact on more people than someone who may be maybe a, a decision maker or something like that. So that's how I kind of consider that question is think about maybe reframe and take a step back and think about your, how you define power and think of power as service instead, as servant leadership and find ways to, you know, grassroots from the ground up work with people and when there's a movement, those in power are going to have to change. So I wouldn't, you know, if you can't go directly to the person who's in charge and say, we want change now, you can start a grassroots, you can link up with two to three people, form a small committee, make a small change. You know, it, sometimes it takes a while, but consider, consider that thinking about how you define power and maybe reframing your, your thoughts on power into more of a servant leadership uh, mindset and what you can do with the people around you in order to affect change. And after a while, those who are in power and leadership, they will not have a choice but to make a change because enough people will be making enough noise. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carrie. Yeah, I fully agree. You all can contribute. And even if we are in a smaller group or not in a large community, I think every step is important and grassroots. It goes from both directions, yes. So thank you so much again so for a fantastic talk. And as I said, we have to do something with things. <laughs> and um, yes, and I'm now thrilled to introduce Marianne Hardy. So she will give the next talk. And I didn't share the screen because I think, Marianne, you can directly share your screen. And she's a part of the Directorate of Advanced Research Computing and an assistant professor in Durham University Business School. And at the moment, we, yes, and she will talk about switching off the label, women of tech. Take it from here. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Gosh, that was such a joyous, wonderful talk, Harry. I'm, uh, I'm not going to sing in this one, but uh, yeah, you certainly made me feel, I don't know, uplifted after quite a, a long summer of, of feeling quite the opposite. So I'm really pleased to be participating in this. And thank you, Claire and others, for inviting me too. So um, I'm talking about switching off the label, in uh, label women in tech, which might seem the opposite of what we should be doing, but hopefully my point will become clear as, as we move further through this talk. This talk is based on research that I've been doing for a long time now, so um, a decade worth of field work, examining how global tech professionals work in organizations and form um, part of communities that um, either are women in tech communities or labeled as uh, specific uh, tech communities taking on um, diversity, inclusivity and equality issues. Over the course of the research, I've spoken to nearly 600 professionals located in the UK, America, China and Taiwan. And I recruited participants because I myself have been involved in tech communities for a very long time. And um, I guess I should share my personal experience of why that is. At college, I wanted to learn um, how to um, do computer programming and went to my college tutor and said, this is what I want to do. 
uh, and he asked me what um, background I had in computing and I said well not much I kind of muck around on my on my dad's computers at home but this is something I'd really like to take forward and in the professional sense so if I could do it for A levels uh, that would be great and this was the 1990s um, again feeling a bit old now um, and he just he told me directly no that wouldn't be possible and that I should take up a course that was more suitable um, for a quotes young lady in my position which would be secretarial so how to use computers for touch typing and to do letterheads and that really stuck with me it's um, I felt I felt really dismissed and undermined and very upset about it and it meant that I didn't take up computer science at university. I read English literature instead, which was something I was passionate about, but certainly not what I wanted to do first. Uh, and in doing so, kind of stumbled through my undergraduate uh, studies into a sociology PhD and MSc, and through that got interested in tech communities and how they formed supportive networks, how they challenged people in positions of authority who were the people such as my college tutor saying no, uh, which led to this, which led to this research, which is, which is now a book. Um, so what I set out to do initially was to look at tech communities and how they articulated and experienced um, the issue around diversity and how they played that forward and were these bubbles of support, how effective were they, those kinds of questions. The aims of this talk this afternoon is, is to think about how tech communities and such as those around RSE can promote diversity and inclusivity, but also how can we achieve equity, which is nice to having just heard Carrie speak, to caution against over-labeling or privileging categories in place of enabling policy. So my argument is that we're getting distracted by labels, we're getting distracted around the shorthand of things such as women in tech, uh, and to really ask what is happening in terms of policy change to promote inclusivity in ways that are effective and not just happening in isolated bubbles. To speculate if we can align inclusivity agendas and how that's been established successfully in communities um, and certainly within emerging communities within HPC and also RSE and also to enable us to dis discuss the impact of labels and how they're aligned to the promotion of equality. Um, but again, mindful that we don't get tethered into um, simply focusing our attention on what the label says rather than actually what the label means. Okay. So what was I doing in terms of this research? Well, I set out to do a pilot study in 2010, which was the um, first wave of interviews and a small survey of tech professionals asking about their experiences of diversity. So everything from how they got their first job, uh, what happened in terms of um, professional training, uh, what support they had for promotion, those kinds of things. That snowballed into um, a first formal wave of data collection and data analysis. Um, um, which was um, multiple interviews across um, all four countries and all four regions. Um, also did some focus groups and a mixture of face-to-face -face interviews and a mixture of, of digital stuff as well, because in the middle of all this research, 2015, 2016, I was pregnant um, and found myself on a travel ban. So <laughs> suddenly technology was my friend in terms of data collection. Um, I've spoken to a lot of people um, in terms of where they are in their um, career pathway. So everyone from very junior uh, entry level um, uh, intern uh, ships to right up to CEOs and directors who own large scale tech companies. Um, I was mindful that I wanted to get a range of um, age groups uh, and I asked questions around, you know, disability, um, what, what communities that they identify with in terms of support, um, where they categorize themselves in terms of basic information. So looking at ethnicity, age, gender, sexuality, those kinds of things. Uh, I was mindful as well to get some um, data around the annual salary of participants and to look at their education background as well. Um, that was important. I'm a social scientist, so I want to get a deeper narrative as, as to what's going on in terms of people's motivations around working in the tech industry, but also how they pay it forward in terms of helping and enabling and advocating for each other, which is when I stumbled across, 
across this problem. Now, I've been um, active and supportive um, within tech communities for a very long time, um, nearly two decades now. And at the beginning, I got involved with um, a group that had just started up in London called the Girly Geek Group, which then turned into Girl Geek Dinners. Uh, and the founder, Sarah Blow, had invited um, women to come together who worked in the tech sector to simply talk about their experiences of the profession, how they got into the workplace, how we could advocate for each other, because she was mindful that time and time again, she was being asked to be either on a panel um, or contribute to a think tank or policy documents simply because she happened to be a woman uh, and then the work in tech bit. So her professional um, reputation kind of came second and her gender came first. And then we noticed something very interesting between us because we shared those experiences. Uh, and I was then on the career pathway in academia and I found myself invited into um, research meetings um, and pitching sessions uh, and impact um, experiences um, and very candidly those people were talking about that um, the, the means to kind of get better leverage uh, and better noise around those projects because they needed a tokenistic woman in the room um, and that began to grate quite a bit I'll confess um, and it just became clangingly obvious that one of the problems we have around inc inclusivity and indeed equity is that we are labeling the wrong thing. When we label, and um, we use the label shorthand, women in tech, we're not really labeling what the problem is. We haven't labeled it lack of diversity in tech or lack of inclusivity. We haven't labeled it lack of bias training in tech. We've labeled it women in tech, which puts the problem first and foremost back onto women again and it also means it puts a solution first and foremost back onto women again and I was really struck by this because when I was an undergraduate I was reading a lot about the uh, women's um, suffragette and also feminist movements through the 1960s and 1970s in the states and I was privileged enough to have a university tutor who introduced me to the work of Betty Friedan. Friedan was writing in the early 1960s and she was really struggling with the concept of success for women at that time was that you were leading in the home. You were a housewife, you were a homemaker. And she felt very depressed and trapped um, in that condition. Um, and she started to speculate that there is a serious problem here in society that has no name. Um, and the reason it had no name is because that you should be, as a woman, satisfied with your place within the home, bringing up the kids and your husband out at work. So she wrote the book, The Feminine Mystique. When I was um, first going around tech communities and we talked about how we would label ourselves and how we would advocate for each other, it struck me that the opposite problem was true. We very much have a name, but we've labeled it ourselves. Um, and we've punched ourselves in the back, as it were, with the label women in tech. Um, so it's a phrase that feels clumsy. Uh, it feels as though we're bringing together lots of different labels and backgrounds without due, due thought, um, which makes the label itself irrelevant, really. Um, we're sort of looping together lots of different groups as a kind of generalized other, and we're missing more nuanced discussions about sort of the hardships and the personal pitfalls that one might face and the challenges that we need to overcome. Women in tech is increasingly used and designed to be inclusive, she says, using inverted commas, but actually it's having the opposite problem. It's failing as a phrase. The lumping together feels haphazard, clunky. Um, and we find ourselves, you know, bundled up in terminology that doesn't really mean anything. Um, the experience that we have moving forward means that we don't necessarily need to delete labels entirely, but we do need to be mindful of how powerful and how misleading they can be, okay? So through writing the book, I did some iterative 
research around sort of the historic use of the women in tech label and how it became mainstream. And there were three main sources. The first was from pioneering grassroots women tech groups who wanted to advocate for and advance the status of women in the tech industry. And those groups became more visible around the early 2000s, but there's certainly much earlier examples of, the, of those kinds of groups going, going right back to the 1960s. The second place that the Women in Tech label has become popular is through media and press articles to describe the state of the tech industry and to critique the lack of diversity and in particular popular press articles using the framework or the rather the shorthand of the Women in Tech were very commonplace since the late 2000s used by Forbes, New York Times, so on and so forth. The third place that we have an iterative use of the Women in Tech label and how it has become mainstream is from government and industry reports to kind of point out the problem. Um, and there's two examples of this. So one is the UK's equality strategy, building a fairer Britain, and the other is the UN's gender science and technology report, um, which was setting out the role of the then due 2010 commission of the status of women. Um, and again, using shorthand, the label women in tech to point out the problem, um, but really focusing that problem on women and not paying attention to what the real problem is in terms of a lack of inclusivity, equity and diversity within the community, or even a lack of um, proper advocacy to get beyond specialist groups and actually take that, take that to a level where we don't, we don't need those labels anymore, okay? Here is um, a direct quote from um, one of my research participants. So she is a software engineer, has been for 15 years and based in the UK. This was her perspective. You're viewed as a woman in tech and you constantly have a target on your back and you have to prove that you're more than a label. So she felt hired um, by the overemphasis of her being a woman first and then in tech second, much as, as was Sarah's experience in setting up the Girl Geek dinners originally. And again, reflecting on my own experiences of, of being an academic, but also someone who um, moves around the tech communities. And there have been, numerous times and unfortunately this year is also high high on the list of years that i have been called forth to be part of a panel because they want my experience as a woman first and then my professional capacity as a in tech person second and that's frustrating sometimes that's appropriate um but often that's coached in language of well we have you know, the other panelists will be men it'll be good to have diversity and it's like that's not really diversity <laughs> and you have that awkward exchange to experience. What I'm proposing then is that there is a straitjacket around the women in tech label and we're treating this as a status characteristic. Now I wish I was original to come up with status characteristic of my own um, uh, thoughts but this is inspired by Ridgway and Coral's analysis of looking at motherhood. So what they did was to look at the status of women uh, professionals in the States and look at disadvantage in the workplace. So how those professionals were treated compared to their male colleagues. Uh, and they wanted to analyze mothers and to see how much contention there was in terms of the roles of being a mother in the workplace compared with being any other worker, okay? Um, and they found that the effect was to make motherhood seem more directly relevant to workplace performance, forming an element in cultural stereotypes um, and how people were delineated by social distinction. So you could have any categories. So whites, non-whites, men, women, mothers, non-mothers, so on and so forth. So motherhood became a key status characteristic in the workplace. And what this meant for the women in their study is that their professional lives were overridden by how they were viewed as mothers first and workers second. Um, and in a similar way, the women in tech label has become an equivalent status characteristic. It's widely shared as a cultural marker and signifier that ascribes a different status or a different set of competencies to those workers over there that come under the label women in tech that's based solely on gender. So he hence, I view it as a bit of a straitjacket. Um, it means that attitudes and behaviors are formed around the label that might not be true and carry their own prejudices. And it creates the perception immediately of in and out groups. Um, it's also highly problematic if you identify as a woman who works in tech 
but you don't necessarily want to be um, labeled in such a way, or you don't want to formally be part um, of very specialized women in tech communities for whatever reason, okay? Now, within my research, I thought, right, well, I'll do some digging around as to the profiling of, of kind of the resonance of this label. So this was a tuning fork. What would happen if the tuning fork was the women in tech label and we, and we set it to tune? What kinds of um, resonance, what kind of tone, what kinds of markers would come out of that. And this is what I found. So this was um, from interview data and focus group data talking with tech professionals. This is talking to women and men in the tech industry um, based in the UK, the US, um, and also in China and Taiwan about the kinds of different labels and meanings that are that come under the umbrella, the label women in tech. So what were the stereotypical labels, what the stereotypical terms that kind of fell alongside um, the women in tech label? And um, I hope it's easy to see this. So it's not a great diagram to be sharing on Keynote, but still. Um, the, the clusters that you can see in orange, the colored ones, those were attributes that were behavioral um, or gendered um, in terms of um, their meaning. And in this case, some examples are emotional, vibrant, exciting, impulsive, family, irrational, passionate, sexy, envy, sensitive. Menopause was an interesting one. Um, the reason they're in different font sizes is to give a sense of how prevalent they were uh, in terms of the research. So if they were mentioned a lot, um, then they are emboldened and in their larger font size. And if they were mentioned not quite as much, then we have a slightly smaller font size, okay? Now, alongside this, we can see that there, there are some interesting traits around the women in tech label that we might see as really positive things, such as educated, ahead of the game, uh, advocacy, financial excess, admired, um, career-driven, um, dynamic, feminist, so on and so forth, okay? But many of these attributes um, do pivot around the behavioral or gendered categories um, and are distinctly negative, so irrational. Sexy is surprising. Uh, menopause, again, I find distinctly annoying, uh, for want of a better word. Okay, keep these attributes in your head because I wanted to do the same thing with an equivalent label, Men in Tech, which is not a label that necessarily is used in the popular press or even um, used by tech communities, but we're going to look at the Women in Tech label and what are the behavioral attributes around that. It seemed only fair I did exactly the same exercise uh, with my research participants with the Men in Tech label. The first distinction you'll see is a lack of orange, so a lack of behavior or gendered labels around this. Uh, and you'll also see some other distinctions uh, in this labeling. So this is how we would profile the men in tech label. And again, asking the same research participants. Um, so emboldened and dominating in terms of font size, we have leading, important, wealthy, success, respected, engineer. This is the first time that we have a category and a label that is actually specific to a job type and a skill set. Independent, influential. A stark contrast to the characteristics that are given to the women in tech label. Um, and I find that highly problematic in terms of our perception of the label women in tech and in terms of how it can be used to um, uh, advocate and enable change um, through the various tech communities okay so because I was doing this research for a long time and still this research continues, um, I'm trying to <laughs> categorize and give um, a focus to kind of the so what here. And I think there are three important insights that we can start to think about in terms of the women in tech label bias, okay? First is that there is a universal recognition of the status characteristic of the women in tech label. If I was talking to tech workers in the UK um, or in Taiwan or in China or the US, everyone immediately recognized the label um, and the terminology and, and, and what it meant uh, in terms of um, labeling within a community and, the, and how it primed gender stereotypes within tech at a global level, okay? 
The other thing to recognize, hello, <laughs> God, my daughter. The other thing to recognize is that there are status biases in terms of the women in tech label, in terms of how we shape expectations um, of workers um, that might not be relevant to their professional role or indeed their responsibilities at hand. So just like uh, Ridgeway found in her research in terms of professionals who are um, mothers and how they were viewed as mothers first and professionals second, again, the women in tech label has shaped how women are viewed in the workplace. They are viewed as women first who just so happen to be tech professionals second, okay? Alongside this, then, there's also a weighting of professional competencies that were indicative of kind of the performance expectations in response to the women in tech label. And these were typified um, in terms of conversations around um, not feeling secure enough to go for that promotion because I will be asking for flexible working because I have because I have caring responsibilities. Um, the experience of the effect of gender bias in terms of uh, evaluation of work performance um, because again you have caring responsibilities and you're asking for um, flexibility in the workplace and how women perceive their competencies um, in the workplace compared to the men in tech and that was felt to be very different uh, and there really were significant hurdles to overcome in that way there is then a tendency for gender to kind of rear its ugly little head uh, in terms of all of the issues, all of the tensions, all of the discords um, against a background of concern around equality, diversity and inclusivity in tech. Um, and what I've come to view this as a means of gender being deliberately forced to be disappeared. So we view it as dysfunctional. So this is really picking up off the Greek prefix dis, as in dysfunctional, to suggest that when gender disappears, actually, we heighten the emphasis and establish new boundaries. Uh, for example, when we start labeling women in tech, we don't hide gender at all. We're actually making gender more of an issue, okay? Um, and we need to be concerned about that. We need to be challenging that. That causes serious problems in terms of efforts around diversity. Um, some of it... Um, just at an informal level, but actually a lot embedded deeply within the culture, but also in the formal processes of how we might recruit new workers into an organization or institution. And certainly the complexity for um, recruitment uh, and for HR teams to really get over um, those kinds of labels uh, in terms of alleviating tensions, particularly around gender, but we could apply any other label to this, age, ethnicity, um, education background, so on and so forth, okay? Um, so, I'm hoping what we can do then, moving forward, is that we emphasize a change in culture and a change in emphasis around the environment and language of work and being at work. And this was really uh, an important way that women in tech as a label was embedded through the lives um, of the research, of, of the, um, um, of the um, people that I interviewed, of my research participants, okay? Um, and, they f and they spoke at length, not only about how challenging uh, the women in tech label was in terms of um, how it defined their worker identity and left them little room to kind of escape from that, but also the role that the workplace had in fixing those categories in place. I want you to give I'm going to give you just one example of that. So this is the idea of physical place. And this seems even more pertinent now that we are all working from home. So this is a, um, a female software engineer and games designer. She's in the US and I've forgotten to include her age here, but she was in her late forties. And this is a direct quote from speaking to her. So in our office, there's a woman's rest sign um, on a cord that you flip over, um, which um, goes directly over the men's when you need to go to the bathroom. So I applaud how far we've come that we get access to our own potty, but there's still a long way to go um, if we can't SHIT uh, without flipping a sign over on the door. So what happened within this organization is that previously they had very little women working in the office um, and they only had access to a men's toilet. And so to overcome that issue, um, they put a woman's restroom sign over the men's. And when you're a woman wanting to go use the bathroom, you just flip the sign over um, and then you went and used the facilities. Now, 
this might seem like a really um, insignificant um, cause for concern within the workplace, but actually speaks to a much bigger set of issues in terms of how women can be made to feel invisible or that they don't belong, um, or how they are just categorized um, and, and kept to one side um, because their problem has been solved in this case by a, you know, a sign on a door being able to be flipped over. Um, in doing so, there can be um, as a significant feeling of guilt in terms of the space that women want to occupy and take up in the physical workplace um, that actually means that they feel even more excluded um, than before. And I started to observe this sense of spatial um, exclusion again and again and again. A lot of the organizations that I was speaking to had set up quite a lot of dynamic co-working um, areas of innovation. So typically they had ping pong tables, um, lots of um, a, a game room in one case, um, all to kind of increase the sense of, you know, disappearing gender um, to enable advocacy um, and, and a culture of, you know, shared fun play uh, within the workplace. What they hadn't reckoned on though was that um, much of this um, play space was actually based on a very sort of masculine ideal the workplace so whether it was um, bean bags um, with you know um, gamer chairs um, the ping pong tables the arcade machines whatever it was they really hadn't thought about how to make those spaces more equitable um, and accessible for everyone. Um, and this is the experience of one female worker in the UK who said, look, I avoid the co-working spaces. I don't get the humor and I want to keep a professional image at work. And you can see how this resonates again with, with, um, uh, with the research done about mothers in the, in, the, in the workplace in terms of wanting to keep a professional image. So you're not seen as the mother, you're not seen as the woman, but you're seen as a professional in that space. Um, uh, so what you don't do is you don't go into the co-working areas, which are, you know, the playful spaces, um, because you might drop your professional image and you have to work harder at that if you're a woman to sustain it and maintain it. Okay. Um, the physical space of the office and time were often centered around gender narratives. So the role of carers um, and career and separation and, uh, and, and different treatment of women and men professionals in the same organization. And it was telling actually that some of the needs um, that women felt that they were getting misrepresented by and were kind of falling further behind by were exactly the same needs and desires that the men in the workplace also wanted. So this is a software manager from the US who was talking about I'm just going to read this quote to you. I'd like to do more remote working than I currently do, but I find that you're treated differently if you work from home too much. So here's, here's, a, here's a man in tech, if you like wanting to do more remote working, wanting to do more flexible work, and probably right now in the age of COVID, he has his wish. But prior to that, um, he was mindful that if he was out of the office and working from home, that that might taint his professional image or treated differently. Um, and women and men experience that, okay? So what we're finding then is that there are um, numerous work hurdles and tech professional boundaries that you know come along and take us by surprise and and some of that is about the labels that we tag ourselves with and invite in and get stuck with and cannot escape uh, and some of that is being mindful about the the, the culture that we're dealing with, with here, the bigger tech culture, the bigger industry culture and reputation of working in tech, um, which in the past hasn't been as diverse or inclusive as perhaps it should be. And I think these two quotes speak to that very well. So tech doesn't just have a glass ceiling, there's glass doors, walls and floors, and then there's tripwire, lots of tripwires. And another quote, it's very common to be invited for interview, but then it's cocktails and dinner. I had to learn that one the hard way a couple of times, and maybe it's a tech culture thing. Um, so it's kind of the underlying sort of sexist misogyny stuff going on here. Now, thankfully, in my research, that wasn't commonplace, but it, it did rear its ugly head a few times. OK, so what's going on here? are new forms of identity work 
Um, and identity work is nothing new, okay? Um, we've got previous studies, so for example, in the service industry, um, where you're serving hamburgers or insurance selling, this reinforces the cultural valuation of different identity work, which is considered to be appropriate to each gender in each setting. So if you're working in a burger place, the perception of you as a woman in that space compared to the perception of you as a man in that space, how you're treated differently as waiting staff, as a kitchen porter, so on and so forth and we see this time and time again in terms of um, other tensions around particularly feminine identities the role of a wife or a mother um, who and you're asked to undertake specific forms of identity work to bridge the gap um, in the, in professional spaces to make yourself appear more legitimate so you're not just seen as as a mother you're not just seen as a wife okay you're seen in your professional context you're not just seen as a woman in tech okay and certainly from my research, there are two equivalent forms of identity work. The first is to emphasize more typically masculine qualities, so you would avoid differential treatment. And a recurring theme was when I was talking to particularly women who are at the higher end of their career. Um, so they were directors, CEOs, they were the policy makers. Um, they described how they would act like one of the boys, basically. Um, so they could be more accepted. They could just get over um, having to be the woman in the room. And if they shared in kind of the more masculine cultural traits within the professional space, that, that enabled them to get faster up the career ladder than if they didn't. The second was to highlight and align with characteristics associated with the women in tech label. So to do the opposite, to really bed in to the women in tech community. Uh, and as one participant from Beijing noticed, um, a way to feel positive with your sisters. So really to get advocacy uh, from the community. And I think that's only something that's starting to happen quite recently. Okay. Further set of um, um, data to hit you with in terms of the research that I've done. I was interested then if the women in tech label was becoming um, a terminology that was potentially toxic, how might we overcome this? What's happening at the level of recruitment when people go into tech jobs? Who, if we were going to recruit the ideal candidate into a tech role, what would that ideal candidate look like and I ran a few focus groups and these were mixed focus groups so these were women and men participants to look at occupational segregation and to look at what was what what were the explicit skills knowledge and responsibilities asked of workers within those job roles uh, and what were also the behavioral um, characteristics that came out of those um, job adverts and what we did within each focus group there are between 15 and 20 participants in those focus groups um, was to analyze real job adverts so we looked at real job adverts um based they were adverts that were um on global tech job lists um and we started to pick out okay so what were the skills what were the responsibilities what was the job actually asking people to do um what was the level of um salary um what was the um professional experience expected so on and so forth and in very 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 quickly um the we identified um, different indexes, different motivations, different characteristics of the ideal tech worker that centered around um, a strong commitment to work ethic, someone who would embrace change, a dedicated approach, they had leadership experience, take on challenges and risks, solve bottlenecks was a turn of phrase that seemed very popular in job adverts, a strong sense of accountability, great working style, adaptable, so on and so forth. When we put these together, um, in terms of a set of characteristics that might reflect the ideal candidate, what we found was, and particularly talking um, both to women and men within the focus groups, was that they felt that one, this was an impossible ideal that they would never reach, but particularly um, the women spoke very candidly that if they came across a job advert in this way, they wouldn't apply for it. 
they didn't recognize themselves within these traits. They didn't recognize how they would be able to sustain family, home, personal life based on the characteristics asked for out of the job advert. And they didn't know where they would ask for things, women and men in this instance, for, for example, flexible working or remote working. Um, this immediately excluded them. So perhaps one reason um, when we get excited about job adverts and why there isn't you know, a more diverse range of candidates applying is we need to look at the language of those adverts and to hold accountable the different levels of recruitment requirements going forward in terms of how open and inclusive and accessible we're making those roles. Are we being mindful um, of what candidates might be thinking in the background in terms of their needs for accessibility, for remote working, uh, for flexible working? Are we including that within the job role description? And if we're not, are we immediately excluding people um, because of that? Okay. So out of this then, thinking about the competencies of the ideal candidate going forward into, um, into tech um, roles, thinking about um, how we might get to a more inclusive and equitable workforce then, how do we enable inclusivity through recruitment? And I think we're facing three crucial issues here. One is the design of recruitment arrangements. And prior to COVID, it was unusual that you would have video conferencing or a video interview. Although now I'm pleased to say, perhaps we've overcome that hurdle, hurrah. Um, also, the distribution of competencies and responsibilities across multiple actors um, and how you form in your head um, the perception of the ideal candidate when you're reading a job role, um, that we need to be mindful of what we're putting down on paper uh, in, terms of, in terms of who that candidate might be. So if we want a more diverse uh, and accessible workplace, are the competencies and the responsibilities that we're talking about on paper, are they reflecting that? Um, and also the capacity of each organization to kind of adapt and incorporate the appropriate change needed, but we need buy-in from senior management teams to be able to do that. So I'm an academic um, and it's very difficult to get change at the top um, enforced um, unless you're very shouty about it um, from the bottom and more often than not um, that is very 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 slow to happen okay so we can identify some of the problems around a lack of diversity in tech that shouldn't just hang off um, the modifier of the women in tech label some of the issues are around, for example, um, so women quotas, they've proven useful, but they also risk a negative reaction from other workers and they potentially undermine the reputation of an organization and do little to encourage inclusivity in the long term. Um, before COVID, we should have been thinking about office structures, so physical office spaces um, and how they encourage or disrupt staff interaction, how they might impede inclusivity. Um, is there a risk of outliers um, in terms of some staff being viewed as, you know, part of CIS operations compared to research operations over here compared to, I don't know, academic operations over there? Um, we should also be mindful in terms of um, the types of contracts that we're able to play forward um, and certainly within academia but i know within the tech industry as well there are lots of um, conditions that introduce precarity for the workforce so short-term contracts uh, a lack of staff retention um, that we really need to kind of move away from now and overall, there's a lack of trust by some tech workers that organizations have their best interests at heart. Um, and and, and, and the, the buy-in, I suppose, from the top in terms of advocacy for the bottom, all right? Let me give you an example of that. When I was working with a well-known tech company, I'm not gonna name them, um, who are based in London, and they brought me in uh, to one of their training days, which was a training day around unconscious bias uh, and I was still doing data collection for the book at this time um, and they were mindful that they were an organization that had predominantly white men, uh, very little women in the workplace and certainly no one um, who was um, black or different ethnicity. 
Um, and they had a meeting to kind of talk about how to overcome those challenges and to be more inclusive, um, which I found very interesting. However, my sort of red alert button at the end of the day went off when I had an email uh, from the then CEO and director who has since gone on to do other things, uh, asking me if I could have a review of their website, which they'd remodeled um, out of out of the unconscious bias training that morning. Uh, I was curious and went on and looked at the website. And what they had done was take stock images of um, some black women professionals and other women professionals and put them on the website um, to make them appear more inclusive. I felt it was a cheap shot. It felt tokenistic. Uh, it felt like the wrong thing to do and did not reflect at all the organization uh, on the ground. Now, I appreciate where they're coming from and they thought they were doing the right thing, but that kind of tokenistic statement doesn't get us very far uh, and simply hides behind the problem um, of the label women in tech. It's not advocating change, it's not getting us to an equitable status at all, it's simply changing some images on a website to make you look better. Uh, and frankly, that's not good enough, okay? Um, so you'll be pleased to know I've got two slides left. So how do we find solutions? How can we enable inclusivity. First, I think we need to take a sharp look at career pathways and progression frameworks and to make those visible and to make sure that we have buy-in at all levels in terms of recruitment uh, for accountability in terms of skills training uh, and potential progression uh, long term for workers. Okay, We need to move away solely from gendered interventions, so not just focus on the women in tech, um, but look at inclusivity at, at all levels um, in professional roles, management, the types of investment, uh, funding to sustain profession, to sustain specialist groups where that is needed, uh, and how we can advocate for each other. Um, we need to be mindful of the different workplace environments and cultures, and I suppose no more uh, so now that we are all kind of working from home remotely, um, and what challenges that might pose for some who might have caring roles, others who might not, those who have access to reliable, fantastic internet, and those of us who are grappling daily with Plusnet. Um, and also to acknowledge specialist groups and emerging communities, but to ask challenging questions of those groups and communities about what they are trying to do and how they are trying to get there and how we can help them do that too. So they're not just doing it in a bubble over here. Um, some of the women in tech groups, it's fantastic what they are achieving, um, but they're doing it on their own. And it's women, again, who are late, you know, who are um, underneath the problem, trying to come up with a solution. And we, we need to change that, okay? Oh, phew, final slide. Okay, future directions. I suppose for me, it's to keep going back to um, um, the research, keep talking to women and men tech professionals, keep talking to advocates within the community and to understand where change is needed and how we can take advocacy to the next step and to not labor and get stuck with unnecessary labels. Um, to move away from a lack of understanding of the problem, to find alternatives to promoting inclusivity uh, and how, how we can feed that into, into the broader tech industry. Um, to think about the implementation of any inclusivity proposal. So it's not a tokenistic series of images on a website, but something that represents good policy today and in the long term, okay? And not to lose sight of the core problems of the women in tech label and danger of aligning with narratives about sexism and misogyny. And if I had longer to talk to you, I could talk to you about another chapter in the book, which was how the label aligned to hashtag me too, hashtag everyday sexism and kind of the tensions that we would have there. Okay, and that's it. Thank you so much. For no singing, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it's okay. I was prepared to break your keynote up in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> you did. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you also your daughter for joining. Very cute. <laughs> that was nice, yep. I was just trying to listen to what she was doing. Apparently there was a dragonfly. <laughs> <laughs> so we have two questions and I, I will I'll read them. So excellent talk. 
I'm reminded strongly of the IET's recent fairly disastrous campaign to promote engineering as a career to young women in the UK. Lots of tone deaf images of lipstick. Oh, I saw that. Oh, yes. Oh, gosh, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, do you have any thoughts on how we can encourage professional organizations to act in ways that actually promote women's needs? flexible working, for example, rather than the endless well-meaning campaigns for young women to come into the field. Yeah, I, th I think there's lots of things we can do. Um, and what I should have done for this talk actually is, is compose a kind of Google Docs as to stuff we can do. But um, the, the main one is we need buy-in from the top. So there's no use, you know, trying to do something from the bottom if, if people at the top aren't also supporting us. And luckily, I think I'm optimistic that we're now at a stage where that buy-in should, shouldn't even have to be more than a conversation of we want to do X for X reason and why haven't we done it before and absolutely we will do that. Um, what I've found, so um, I've, I've, despite the, 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 the guys well-meaning, uh, putting images onto a website to make them appear more inclusive, I've had better success of going into tech companies and actually one talk I did at the cabinet office in, in Westminster they were mindful that they had people in the room who were not only from senior management positions, but also people who had literally just started working for the cabinet office that month, um, but also people from HR. So across the board, so very junior people, very senior people in the room, but actually people from across the organization uh, coming together to kind of to, to talk about this and, and, and to find ways of, of, of overcoming and responding to inclusivity, particularly within the tech sector. Uh, in terms of short answers to this, I would absolutely avoid anything that is sort of stereotypically gendered. So yeah, I saw the lipstick adverts. Um, and while very well meaning, um, is a bit tedious in terms of the record being stuck on the same women in tech, women in tech, women in tech, and we're not, we're not able to get to the equitable situation that we want to. And, and I think the early days, or at least certainly my personal experience of being involved within women in tech communities, and certainly the girl geek dinners at, in the early 2000s was that I felt finally there was a place for my voice to be heard and it wasn't scary and it felt supportive. But, and because of that support, I started going into other just generic tech communities, which I would never have done before, um, that weren't labeled women in tech, um, that would just happen to be about tech. Um, and it was there that I started to find, I mean, of course, the same prejudices and biases that you come across, but also advocacy and a real sense of, you know, the needs of just general tech workers who all wanted the opportunity to have flexible working, um, who all wanted the opportunity for, you know, a visible career pathway. Um, all those needs should be met by all workers. And, you know, it sounds a bit cheesy, um, but it's, it's, that, it's that coming together and being mindful of, of how we can make that more visible and be more honest about it from the start. And that needs to start from the level of recruitment, but also training within organizations too. So um, one of my experiences as an academic this week is, is taking online unbiased training. And frankly, that's not good enough. It's good that we have sustained online training, um, but we more than just kind of a webinar about it needs to happen. There wasn't any, after taking the webinar, there, were, there was no call to action. There was no, and now this is going to happen. So we need to sustain the momentum behind it, um, address the issues, talk about them, and then do the so what part. That's the hard bit. Yeah, thank you very much. So we have another two questions and I would still take them and then we might want to switch to short break and have some networking still, uh, we will see. So one question is, I found women in technology groups and conferences helpful mm -hmm. and empowering in the past. How can we get rid of WIT as a label while still enabling such groups? I agree. And today I still find women in tech groups um, helpful and empowering, I have to say. Um, I, I, guess, I guess part of the problem with the label is um that we still we, we firmly point the solution and the problem in the same place and and that is onto women um i don't think we necessarily need to completely delete the label i think 
we need to avoid the tokenistic and popular press uses of it, the shorthand for the women in tech, without acknowledging, um, you know, the individualized experiences of this. I mean, to give an example, we've um, had um, conversations um, at Durham recently about inclusivity, uh, and particular around BAME, and um, you know. Um, sexuality as well, but we've 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 had those conversations in silos. So in a group dedicated to BME, or a group dedicated to disability, or a group dedicated to gender, there isn't the opportunity um, to take on board that actually those issues can all come together. Indeed, they can all come together in the same person sometimes. Um, so um, I'm kind of teasing with the. Uh, uh, title of my talk in terms of turning off the women in tech label i just think maybe we need to turn the volume down in terms and and really think about what we're what we're pointing at and 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 what we're labeling and who we are labeling and why um and a lot of the grassroots and community actions around women in tech is fantastic um but often they operate outside um of the main um, the broader tech community and actually it's the broader tech community who also needs to be part of that and and we need to kind of find a way to make that happen and I don't have a, a single solution for that yet except for, for us to keep making noise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. The next question is do you know of resources for non-gendered language that is inclusive? Resources that could be used for recruitment. Yes, yes I do and I will set some links up so um, there has there have been some great studies on this that have done um, a mapping exercise of recruitment adverts, which is looking at gendered language, how you can neutralize it. Um, and they've even set up a nice piece of software that you can do. You can so what you can do is you can run an advert through it um, to look at how gendered it is in its tone and things. So I can I can share those links. That's that's not my research. That's someone else's, and I've forgotten their name now. But I will I will share and set up those links. Um, what I'd like to do going forward is to have a way where yeah we can we can absolutely have a more inclusive and accessible accessible set of terminology um, that isn't clunky um, or isn't a tokenistic sentence at the end of a recruitment advert that says we particularly welcome participants from backgrounds of disability and blah 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 because it's like well that's not good enough frankly um, so yeah 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 thank you so much yeah maybe we can put some material together from from this webinar on the website and also i would like to add some material and of course i blanked also on the name but i read an interesting study for yeah giving references to to women yes. yeah and there's often the verbiage is different than if you write it for a man so so it's really looking at this research one quick example if i may i've just recruited to four new posts um tech posts um at durham and um and so you have to legally ask the edi question it's called the edi question so the equality diversity and inclusivity question and hr sends you um a list of questions that you have to you know generally ask all uh candidates and the edi question was always the last question and I'm like, I'm not having this. I'm going to put this as the second question and see what happens. I changed the tone of it. It was still an EDI question, but totally changed the tone of it, changed the order of it. That was a game changer in terms of how those job interviews went. There were some candidates who were obviously surprised. Everyone's going to expect an EDI question, but they're not going to expect it to be the second question. Um, there were some who really flew on it who really considered it and talked at length. So it was almost their entire interview time about it. And which if you stick it on the end, you do not have time to do that. Having that dialogue, having that openness at the top, that was a game changer. I mean, that was only with four candidates. So it's only my personal experience, but little things like that make a huge difference. Um, so yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you very much again. I know you should hear a lot of applause. <laughs> Also, you carry. So, thank you both very much. I share my screen again. I'm only not fully sure. So, the official time would end in 12 minutes. We thought that we would have something like a five minute break, then we would have now five minutes for networking. I'm not so sure. 
whether we want to do that. Um, so the idea would be who can stay longer? Um, I think we planned from the organization committee anyway to stay a little bit on longer. So who wants to stay longer for networking? Here is the networking uh, URL, the Zoom. It's a different Zoom than this one. Um, and we would all meet there in five minutes. And I would stay only on in this Zoom for a while in case some people come back here by accident and then I send you to the other Zoom room. <laughs> and I would like to say, yes, yeah, so the next uh, week we have also an exciting program by Dr. Amy Sang. Um, she talks about executable research article and ritual research paper with code and data. And um, it will be at 2 p.m. UTC. And we have different times with the different programs. I think we, we talked a little bit about it. We try to adapt it to different time zones. And if you apply or submit something, you can also give the times that are convenient for you. And so that we have also participants from all over the world that you can give also your presentation twice so that you hit the different time zones. So we are very open there. And with this, um, thank you very much, again, the keynote speaker. Thank you very much, the participants, and uh, making this an exciting first launch of SOURCE. Um, thanks to all the organizers. Um, and I would just say, for the moment, I give it now to Claire. Sorry to put you on. But so, um, so for the next SOURCE events, I think we, we will have different hosts and it will go on with the different uh, formats. Yeah. And, and now I give it to Claire. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> that was it really. We'd like to see you all in this in, in the Zoom meeting in five minutes after a five minute break, just a simple socializing together. But thank you all for coming along and joining us at the launch. And uh, the, the programs on the um, on the websites, please do get involved. And as I said, calls for contributions, the call for contributions is still open. So please do put something in during September. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.